Good afternoon. On behalf of the Carbon County Community Foundation and the United Way of the Greater Lehigh Valley, welcome to the first session of the 2020 Carbon County Nonprofit Forum. My name is Sharon Alexander, and I am the ex new Executive Director of the Carbon County Community Foundation. The Community Foundation connects people who care about Carbon County to the local causes that matter most. We work with donors to create legacies of giving, investing in nonprofit organizations with strategic grants, and leading our community to a better future. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for all Carbon County residents now and forever. Aligning with that mission, this networking and skills building event is held each year as a way to connect like-minded people from the nonprofit, government, and professional sectors in Carbon County. It usually takes place annually in person in the spring. However, as we all know, this year threw us some curveballs. We are thrilled that we were able to pivot and transform this into a virtual event, thanks in large part to the support of our sponsors and speakers. We sent out a survey a couple weeks ago to find out what it is that you all want to discuss, learn, and explore especially in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic and the public shutdowns that occurred as a result. The sessions we have lined up this week, which you can see on the screen now, are based on your responses. I will add that it's not too late to register for any of these sessions, so if you see something that you didn't sign up for but you'd like to attend, or if you have a colleague who's interested, please do contact me and I can add you to the registration. All of the sessions, with the exception of the workshop on Friday, will be recorded. So even if you are not able to participate live, you can listen to the program later at your convenience. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize our wonderful sponsors, whose generosity has allowed us to offer this program to the region free of charge. Their logos are on the screen. We rely on the support of community partners like these and appreciate their generosity. I would also like to recognize and thank United Way for their partnership in producing this event and other ever endeavors throughout the year. In just a few minutes, I'll introduce Marcy Lesko from United Way, who's going to talk about the importance of collaboration. And I just have to say, they really do walk the walk when it comes to collaborations and partnerships across the region. But before that, a few housekeeping items. Earlier today, all registrants should have received via email a copy of the Nonprofit Forum Program Book and Resource Guide. This document contains the schedule for the week, as well as all, um, program descriptions and speaker bios. There are also some resources included that might be helpful to you after this week. Um, I encourage you to check that out and share with your colleagues. In addition, you should also have received a copy of the Carbon County State of the Child and Family Report. This is a document produced biannually by the Carbon County Collaborative, formerly the Carbon County Interagency and Family Collaborative Board. It contains statistics and demographics specific to Carbon County. I'm also gonna upload both of these documents into the chat box for you to download in case you did not receive the email. Uh, you should have been automatically muted when you entered the room. We just ask that you keep yourself on mute when you are not talking. However, we do want this to be interactive. So if you have a question or a comment, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Uh, you can also use the chat box and we'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the program. And now on to today's program, Better Together, Collaboration in Challenging Times, presented by Marcy Lesko, Executive Vice President of the United Way of the Greater Lehigh Valley. Marcy, a resident of Palmerton, is a strategist, collaborator, facilitator, critical thinker, and agent for systems change. At United Way, she helps to propel the $21 million organization to success and to foster community growth. Marcy's recent expertise extends to United Way's marketing and communications, strategic technology, collective impact, community capacity building, and leading the organization to model diversity, equity, and inclusion. Marcy's 22 year career in human services has offered experiences in public health, victim services, bullying prevention and intervention, juvenile offender mediation and education reform. She supports and nurtures many community change initiatives across the greater Lehigh Valley and has offered her expertise and time with several state and national endeavors. 
Marcy is a proud member of Women United and has won five distinguished awards in her community, including the Human Relations Commission, the Donnelly Award for Children's Advocacy, the Girl Scouts of Eastern Pennsylvania Take the Lead Award, the Community Achievement Award, Lehigh Valley Business Woman of Influence, and the PBS 39 Good Neighbor Award. Marcy, to you. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I am excited to be here with you today, and this is going to be a very interactive presentation. So I don't know about you, but I have been zoomed out about as far as you can get, and I have found that I have enjoyed it when there, I'm not just uh, participating in a sit and get, um, where I'm trying to absorb even more information in this time of just information everywhere. So. I would like to encourage you to take a moment and as I'm talking to introduce yourself in the chat box with your name, uh, your uh, title if you have one or if you'd like to share it and the organization if you're affiliated with one. Um, I'm gonna be asking you to use the chat box a few times um, throughout my time here today and I'm gonna be really setting the stage for the next um, three or four days of time that you have here. So um, I'm hoping that, um, that you'll enjoy our time together. So I need to mention that I am a resident of Carbon County, as, um, as Sharon said, and, and thank you for that. And um, I just have a, a, little, a, a little funny story to get us started here. So I live on Hans Dairy Road in Palmerton, right over Blue, um, you know, the back end of Blue Mountain. And um, just, I've fallen in love with the entire community. I joined the Concourse Club, I'm like all in, um, in Palmerton and uh, in Carbon County. But, um, I have to tell you, we've lived here for three years and I have two boys and my youngest son um, and I were talking recently and I said, you know, the Appalachian Trail is just up the road. We really, I would really like to check it out sometime. I've never been up there. I would really like to do it and I would like you to go with me. And he said, well, I guess if you want to die a dysentery, we can do it. And I said, dysentery? What? What are you talking about? And he said, look it up. It's the number one cause of death. Up there on the uh, up there on the trail, and I said that's Oregon Trail, the game, not Appalachian Trail, the trail up the road from here. So thankfully, dysentery is gone, but we do have COVID, um, and so we're dealing with all of these things right now. And um, it's been a, an interesting time for all of us. So I thought you might appreciate that. Um, I, I also want to say thank you to the Community Foundation for being such a solid partner and of course to all the sponsors that have offered um, uh, their support for this endeavor and for the work that we're doing together. I have to tell you, you know, it's the irony isn't lost on me. Um, maybe irony is the wrong word, but um, 10 years ago when I started at, uh, well, I started United Way 14 years ago, but 10 years ago or so, I remember sitting down with the community foundation for like the first time and we were each known to each other as kind of the evil empire that we don't work with we don't play with those kids um they do their thing we do our thing and and never the two shall cross and now we can hardly do anything without each other and so um and i part of my presentation is to talk about sort of how you get there so we have um we have about an hour or so together. I've got a couple breakout exercises and some things today. But as we dig into it, I would like to know what are you looking forward to from this presentation or just over the next four days? So what is it that you want to get out of this? Why did you sign up for it? What are you hoping to get out of it? So I want to encourage you for just a few moments to go ahead and put that right into the chat box. Um, and Aaron uh, Conley on our team and Sharon Alexander will be combing through there to summarize that and to use that as a guide for the next few days. So I'm gonna give you just a couple minutes to go ahead and put that in the chat box, if you will. Again, what are you hoping to get out of our time together?
Wonderful. Great. Yeah. Fundraising in the age of COVID is uh, an interesting time. Yep. Great. So I want to encourage you to continue to add your thoughts there in the chat box as we go. Um, thank you for uh, adding some things, things in there. Um, some of you have sort of thought, well, I thought I was going to be able to just sit here and listen and not have to participate, but here we are. So great, some great, great stuff here. So go ahead and continue to add those things. So 2020. So I don't know if you've seen this cartoon before, but this for me really sort of summed up uh, where we are in the middle of a pandemic, trying to lead nonprofits and trying to figure out um, how we go forward from here. So, you know, we can sort of say, let's face it, this has been a really challenging year uh, between a global pandemic and election year, racial unrest, and just about every other thing on the planet sort of happening all at once, wildfire, I mean, pick one, right? Um, I, I found this uh, cartoon to be amusing. I also found another one that said, establish dominance with your therapist by making them cry first. Um, and the reason I'm starting with this is because effective collaboration begins with you. And it begins with um, your ability to be your best self, and frankly, nearly every person that I'm talking to right now privately about sort of what's going on as they're leading this work or participating in this work or serving their community in some way is exhausted. There was an article that came out in August um, about something called um, your surge capacity being depleted. And um, the surge capacity is our body's ability. It's a collection of systems that are designed to um, help us survive um, an acutely stressful situation. Unfortunately, what happens is, like in a natural disaster or some other crisis, what happens is those things have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And there's eventually an end. And where we are right now is our bodies were not meant for, our, our surge capacity was not meant for this longevity that we're experiencing right now. So a lot of people are feeling um, a lot of different ways about what's going on. They're exhausted, they're emotional, they are feeling depleted, they're feeling tired, um, they're feeling um, hopeful, angry, disappointed. They are feeling the both and things of, I appreciate that I could slow down, you know, they're seeing the silver lining of the pandemic, I could be with my family, life could slow down a little bit, and the worry and uncertainty. And so I point this out because you'll see a, a little bit later I'm going to be talking about um, some tips and tricks on sort of collaborating in a time of crisis. But I really want to underscore that for many of us who are serving in community, our surge capacity is depleted or needs to be refilled or we are experiencing that cycle and to be gentle with ourselves uh, during this time because we are doing some of the hardest work. We're serving the community in a time of ambiguity and uncertainty and trying to find our way through this. And so I wanted to begin with that. The frame of reference that I'm going to be using um, that I, um, when I talk about uh, collaboration is a model that I have studied extensively I've spent time with with experts um, all over the globe and sort of understanding how we um, what effective collaboration looks like. And so in 2011, a consulting group called FSG studied how complex social issues could be solved together. Uh, successful, um, successful ways that complex social issues had been addressed. Homelessness, um, environmental health and protection methods, education reform, a variety of different things. And so they studied these social, complex social issue um, initiatives, these coalitions, these efforts 
and they noticed patterns on what made those things successful. And so in 2011, they published an article called, about something called collective impact. Some of you may be more or less familiar with it. Some of you may be very familiar. Some maybe haven't ever heard this phrase before. Maybe you've heard of it a little bit. But these were the five initial conditions that were published. Now it's since grown and additional conditions have been added as people have kind of massaged the model. But this is nothing more than a disciplined form of collaboration. This is a model, a framework for collaboration. And so it's not the be all end all, it's not for everything, but this, when I talk about collaboration, this is kind of one of the, I'm thinking of cross sector collaboration, ways that people work together. So the first and foremost is a common agenda. Um, so everybody's sort of rallying around the same thing, identifying what that thing is and then rallying around that. Having a shared measurement system. So we agree on what it is we want to achieve and we measure it the same way. Um, and we are clear about um, that we're talking about the same thing, we have common language, common measurement. We have mutually reinforcing activities. I know that a few years ago, my colleagues at the Ryder Pool Foundation in Lehigh Valley have been very successfully um, leading a collective impact fellowship for a few years. And I know that what it has done is their intentional sort of cross-sector collaboration of folks participating in that has produced a lot of interesting results. So you have, you know, someone who is affiliated with a funeral director and the head of drug and alcohol sitting in the same room sort of saying, we're really tired of kids dying of, op of the opioid crisis. We together are both tired. We want to see something different. It's breaking our hearts. How can we collectively work on those issues? And again, some of you may be farther along on that. As I've gotten to know Carbon County, there's beauty in the way that you pull together around community, but it is intentional, mutually reinforcing. It means you do this piece, I do this piece, we do the thing together. Continuous communication. So there's a way that we are continuously communicating about what we're doing together in community. And then there's a backbone organization. And this has been really important for us because we believe very strongly in backbone organizations. A backbone organization is the glue. They're the group that brings everybody together and focuses them on the common goal, on the common thing, and then keeps the work moving. So why do I share that with you? As I am thinking about um, and preparing my remarks today, I kept coming back to my frame of orientation is this model. It's a helpful model and can help us from a, a grounding space on how we do collaboration. Now, anecdotally, many of us have been participating in collaborative endeavors our whole lives. So our first breakout session is gonna be focused on, and I promise there's a rhyme and a reason, we're gonna be broken out into um, a small group for just a few minutes, about 15 minutes total. Um, we'll see sort of where we are with time. And what I want you to think about is the best team experience you have ever had. It could be a time when you were on the eighth grade basketball team. It could be a church team that you were part of. It could be a work team that you're currently part of. Um, I want you to think of the best, just take a few minutes to think, what is the best team experience I have ever had? And then what, were, what was it about that experience that made it a peak experience? What made it so special? Was it that it was fun? Was it that we won? Was it that we all were aligned around it? We all were on the same page, we were friends, what was it that made it a really amazing experience? So I want you to take a moment, you're gonna move into breakout session, and I want you to think about best team experience, and then what were the things that made it a big experience? When you get into your breakout room, I would like you to identify one person that's gonna track the qualities and then post it in the chat box when we come back, because we're gonna review that and go on to the next portion of the presentation. So Sharon, let's head into, that, that, uh, into those breakout sessions.
here. Okay. Can you repeat what you said? How's it going so far? I think everyone's in there. I did five rooms, so there's five people in each. Um, and I was just looking because I I can broadcast a message to everyone, so I was going to copy the um, slides that you had, the questions. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Can you pop me in a new breakout room? I think, can you hit join? Is it giving you a message to join? not automatically sending you for some reason. I've moved it's okay. you. I'll All just right. stay here. It's okay. <laughs> All good. My kid would kill me if he knew I shared that story. <laughs> oh, that's funny. How old is he? 16. <laughs> so he never actually played Oregon Trail. He just knew about it. <laughs> yeah, he's like a walking encyclopedia anyway. I was on a call this morning and somebody's dog was howling in the background. She said they were getting a delivery or something. It was just going nuts. I was like, well, mine will probably be barking right back if they were not sequestered in another room. <laughs> I told my son, I said, take those two dogs and keep them with you. Wow. <laughs> we had a leak in the bathroom yesterday with a plumber here a little bit ago. I'm like, you got to be in and out. Like, I, <laughs> I have people coming. So, hey, mom. Mom, my mom's in visiting from Ohio.
How much more time do we have? Eight minutes. Do you live up here, Sharon? Yeah, I live in Summer Hill. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. My uh, husband is originally from here, and I uh, am a transplant. I've been here about oh. 10 years now. Where from? I um, grew up in New Jersey, and then I lived in, in central Pennsylvania near State College um, all through high school, and then went to college near Harrisburg, so I kind of just moved all over the place. Sure. This was, um, when this position opened up, it was, I was excited because I you know, I've always just commuted. So I was going into Allentown every day. And so the chance to work closer to home was really enticing. <laughs> I bet, I bet. There's a lot of stuff in here about not everybody wanted to, to add anything. Um, my role can impact the community. I want to meet different, different people, cha uh, changing to meet the needs of our people. How's everybody handling the pandemic? Raising I think it's a good mixture of people from Carbon County and from outside of the county here too. So that's that's good. Um, for the second breakout, do you want, I can try and, um, mix things up so that people aren't with the same people. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So just randomly assign them again. Just before we started, um, so my office is in the old, uh, the oil company building in Lehighton, um, but Steve has closed his office. So they, he said, you know, we don't really have walk-in customers or what they don't need to, we don't need to have an office really. So um, it looks like a storefront, but there's no one here. But I, 
at least once a week get people that stop by and try to pay their oil bill, but we keep the front door locked. And so they <laughs> try the door and then they're peeking in the window and I'm sitting right here and I'm like, that's all I need is for someone to do that while I'm talking or something like that. I'm like kind of tucked back in the corner so they can't see when I'm in here, but it's just so funny. Like they're very persistent standing outside and there's a big sign right on the door that says closed to visitors. <laughs> That's funny. So I may ask you to just unmute people um, who, you know, to just say like, you know, let me hear one or two stories. Um, what time does this go till 2.30? 2.30, yeah. I'll probably be done a little bit after two, so. Yeah, that's fine. If we, and it's, um, we can, if we end early, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that there was time that we weren't cramming it in the last yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah. But knowing we're done until 2.30, I, you know, I can speak as long as a person wants me to. I just, <laughs> when they said 20 minutes and then they were like, oh no, it's an hour and 20. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so change to what I was going to say, but it's okay. We roll with it. It's good. I think this is good. I like, it's like a conversation format and um, hopefully people will kind of, when it comes time to the share part, maybe people will turn on their cameras and start talking and, and be a little more interactive. So I think we're getting to two minutes and it's supposed to give them like a heads up kind of thing that that's going to be closing. Boy, 15 minutes is a long time. <laughs> but you know what? I was going to say 10, but what happens is you just get started and then it's over. Like, yeah.
Welcome back. We'll wait a couple minutes while everybody gets back. So I want to encourage uh, the person from your group to go ahead and paste into the chat box the attributes of a of a um, the best team experience that you ever had. Welcome back, folks. So I encourage you to go ahead, a person from your group, to post into the chat box the best team experience, uh, the attributes of the best team experience, um, the best team experiences uh, that your group discussed. I think everyone is back now. Great. While folks are posting that in the chat box, let me hear a couple good stories. Does anyone have one that emerged in your group that you just thought was really interesting? Or that you'd like to share with the group? You should be unmuted. I'll share mine and I, we, I was just very proud of the program that we just pulled off during the pandemic. Um, being in my early 60s and learning the Zoom and uh, pulling off a program that we did this past summer. We had 30 young children between the ages of 6 to 21 with intellectual and developmental disabilities vir do a virtual summer camp. I had three weeks to pull it off. It was called Camp in a Bag. I actually started off as Camp in a Box, but there was too many supplies. They had to go to a bag. but. Um, we had three hours of them um, participating. We had them dancing, singing. We had choir practice. We started our day with uh, walking to the abs because we used to start camp with walking. Uh, we went into um, story time and snack time. We provided the snacks and all the, sto the stories. And then we went into, um, each, in between each session, we put three songs on so they would dance and move, get everybody motivated and keep their attention. And then we went into three arts and crafts and then we went to three games, such as Simon says, scavenger hunts. And then we went to choir practice. Um, it was probably one of the neatest experiences I've ever had. Um, pulling it off, not having a clue that we're going to be able to do this. Learned a lot that Zoom could do. I didn't know you could do breakout sessions, though. I just learned that now. Um, but it was probably, I came from corporate America, did some really neat stuff corporate-wise. But this people-wise, the feedback from the families, from the county, were just phenomenal. So I was very proud of the program. Good team I had working with me. A couple of camp counselors we pulled in, and uh, the kids love seeing the camp counselors return. So it was um, probably the neatest thing I've done during the pandemic. It definitely pulled me out of a, a mental rut because the feedback was great. So that's my story. That's great. It was a happy one. Thank <laughs> you so much. I would encourage folks to give to give that a thumbs up or a high five on your screen. Uh, one more story. Anybody have a really good story? from a great team experience. Erin, is there one from your group you'd wanna share? Yeah, not to put you on the spot, Christian, but I thought your example was a really good one um, from your, your team in college. Do you wanna share that? Yeah, so I, I was a wrestler in college, um, you know, from New York, went to school in Missouri. So a lot of people from out of state coming together, you know, working hard, motivating each other, getting better. Um, you know, wrestling a lot of beating each other and up in practice, but still, you know, coming together for the greater good while you're cutting weight and all that stuff. So it was definitely a coming together experience. So happy to share. Great. Awesome. Great. Well, I did that experience because I wanted to talk about uh, how when we are thinking about collaboration and community, many of those same attributes apply to the work that we do in community. And uh, switch, here we go. Um, 
So I, I was reminded, you know, oftentimes the two most common attributes that come up are trust and fun. Um, I trusted the people that I was with. Um, you know, I enjoyed the people that I was with. Um, or I found a way to get along with the people that I was with uh, in a way that we complemented each other. Uh, we had a common goal, a common vision. We knew what we wanted to get done and we trusted each other. And so this has been one of my favorite quotes. It's been modified through the years. I know that the, I think the original quote was change happens at the speed of trust, but um, I've seen it repeated and progress happens at the speed of trust and the ability to build trust um, in, um, in your colleagues in the community. And this has been a mantra that I have been personally using as I think about building community. I'm gonna share an example of this in a moment, but um, I've been a longtime fan of Dr. Brene Brown's work in vulnerability and shame, um, leadership development and, and other things. And I love this because as we got into the pandemic and as we were sort of reacting to everything that was going on around us and how, you know, how we were gonna get supplies in the community and how we're gonna work with different community partners, um, immediately everyone moved in, you know, in a crisis. But as things started to settle down a little bit and we started to kind of um, then recalibrate, what you saw were some of the typical behaviors that we see in community. Um, and we start seeing that competitive side, that, so it's that side of, well, if they're getting this, then I'm not getting this. And also, um, a commitment to working in new ways means a commitment to our own self in, I am not here to be right, I am here to get it right. And I'm gonna give you an example of that. So last fall, um, and it, can, it connects to this uh, spring and summer. So last fall, there was a terrible fire in one of our communities here in the, in the, uh, the Lehigh Valley. And it destroyed about 20 rural homes, uh, no, it was not 20 rural, it was several rural homes and over 20 families were displaced um, overnight. And every, I mean, it was really a tragic situation. It was scary. I mean, people lost everything. It was just a really serious situation. And the way that it typically goes is um, when a, 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 a traumatic event in the community of that magnitude happens, our friends at the Red Cross, who are often on the scene right there with firefighters, will assess the situation and identify we're talking about a large scale event. So more than 20 families is how we define it. And um, we got the call on a Sunday night. You know, this has happened. This is where we are. We're, you know, at the, at the ground with the firefighters sort of seeing what's going on. We need to do something as a community. We need to do something and respond to this. So we called up our friends at Community Action Committee of the Lehigh Valley and they also agreed, we gotta do something together. And so before long, within 24 to 48 hours, we were holding a press conference. We were announcing the creation of a special fund for the victims of this fire. We were on every media channel. We were posting press releases. We were mobilizing community around this particular incident. And within a very short period of time, we raised up over $100,000 for the families. And so each, you know, every single dollar that was being raised was going right back into the community. People were having fundraisers, they wanted to do different things, all for this community. And it was great. I mean, we felt amazing. We were able to very quickly respond and it was a great thing. What was interesting is that the same time that was happening, the community where the fire had occurred, the grassroots organizations in that community started to mobilize. They were having media events. They were having um, calls for resources, goods, food, support for family, clothing, furniture. Uh, you can't even imagine the amount of resources that poured in for families all over the place. And so we were invited together to stand together on the podium at a, at a podium in a, in a big room where we could speak directly to families. We had a big family meal. We were going to be telling them, presenting them checks, telling them what was coming. I mean, each family stays, you know, stood to get somewhere close to $10,000 cash that they could use uh, for the fire, which was wonderful. What really struck me is that I was there to speak on behalf of the fund with my colleagues from the Red Cross and CACLD, and several folks from the grassroots organizations were there to, spoke as well, to speak as well. And we all spoke, and everyone was declaring victory. 
what was really remarkable about it during our debrief is that we had not worked together. And so we had a, a, at times a little bit of a tense debrief, or we were talking about the fact that we were having our own press conference. We were not including community. We were doing for community, not with community. And so while it was wonderful and it was a victory, no doubt about it, we got the result that we, were, that we came for. But the opportunity to do something with community would be far richer. And so when the next fire came around, rather than immediately launching a fund for the community, as it happened in the middle of the pandemic, we're running around trying to figure out how to get people hand sanitizer and masks and food and everything else under the sun. Next fire comes along, also devastating, about the same level of loss. We said, okay, we, we learned from the last time we've been building relationships. Let's figure out how to build relations. Let, let's figure out how to do this right, how to get it right, not to be right. And so we called those grassroots organizations together and we said, does the community need a fund? Rather than saying, we're doing a fund, we're doing this for community, here you go, here's your check. We said, does the community need a fund? And the answer was no. The community did not need a fund. What they wanted was something different. And not that they couldn't use funding, and there, were, there was funding coming from different sources, and there was support coming from different places, but we didn't need to launch a large fund. And we were able to connect to the needs of the community much faster because we did it together. And to stop being defensive about the fact that we wanted to be right. We want to do the right thing, but to say, how do we get it right? How do we try to get it right? Which challenged us to do it um, a little bit differently. So here is the meat of what I'm going to say. When we're thinking about building collaboration muscles, especially in a time of crisis, it has to start with it has to start with the work that we're trying to, to see the joy in what we're trying to do. I'm not saying, I, I'm not downplaying the magnitude of what we were going through. There's no part of that that's fun, quote unquote. But the work that we're doing with teams and the way we enjoy each other as we are connecting to each other needs to be, to, to have the joy that's there. The second is trust. Um, with trust, uh, the way to build trust is vulnerability um, a lack of um, or um, reducing competition. So in the collective impact world, we talk about building the potluck, not running the poker table. So it means we are figuring out how to build trust with each other and to not see each other as um, mortal enemies as we're going after the same piece of cheese, um, the same work that we're trying to do. Again, to do right, not to be right, to do with community, not for community. So. You know, I don't know about you, but there have been several systems that I have um, used um, in my life, and certainly I've become acutely aware of this, that when I use any system, I mean, when was the last time you tried to call PennDOT and get through, or tried to go and get a license renewal, or try to get whatever, and have you wondered, what would it look like if we had a human-centered design on this? If we took the time to say, the people that are using this, does it work for them? Is this what they need and they want? Is this, does this satisfy their needs? Is this, is this working? So asking those questions takes a little extra time, but it, the payoff is really worth it. So the focus piece is really important. And when I say how to reduce silos and we talk about how to break down those barriers between organizations, you know, there's a, you know, I started with it's about you and what I mean by that is it's about how you show up in community, your best self, your healthiest self. And if you're depleted, you can't show up in community in the best way. You can't show up in community with your best self. When we talk about focus, I'm going to contradict myself a little bit and say, it's not about you. It's about the work we're trying to do in community. One is how you show up. But when you show up, it's not about your personal needs or your organization's needs. It is about the work we're trying to do together, which is really hard if your organization is in survival mode and trying to figure out how to survive. Which means we have to shift from a deficit mindset to an abundance mentality. So how do we only look at things with scarcity? There's only so much money here. There's only so much, so many resources to go around. There's only so um, many things that we can do together into a more um, sense of open possibility. 
there are funders, there are people that would like to pull together to share their resources to get more done than ever before. And we've seen this over and over and over again. When we do one plus one in community, we almost always get six because that better together um, plays itself out in community building. What I mean by chicken little versus barn raising is, uh, I know Laura McHugh, one of our colleagues and some other colleagues are gonna be talking about marketing and messaging and data. I have to tell you, you know, for years as a part of United Way, we would go to community and talk to them about giving back to the United Way. And we would say, it's really bad out there. We just need you to give some of your resources and, and to, to give what you can. And the next year we would come back and say, it's even worse than last year. And the next year we would say, it is the worst it has ever been. And after a while, people start saying, I mean, are you ever gonna make any progress? Is anything gonna change? I mean, is it always just gonna be bad? And so what we had to do was shift our messaging so that we talk about the challenges that are there, but also the solutions to say, it is really challenging. The opioid crisis in our community is devastating and we know what the solutions are or we have some solutions that might help or we know how bad diabetes is and we can change this together so it's a barn raising mentality and a barn raising message i think this is a really important one and i'm speaking to you as someone with 22 years of experience and i have been in a funder seat since 2010 so 10 years i have been VP of impact, overseeing significant amount of funding. I have seen this play out over and over and over again, where people are afraid to ask for what they need. The number one reason people don't give is because they weren't asked. Number one reason, hands down. And so when we think about the amount of money we need to raise or the amount of resources we need to gather, it gets overwhelming. And so shifting to sort of say, okay, how can we break it up? I need $50,000, that's five tenths, or that's 10 fives. Can I get 5,000? I'm not asking you for 50. People like to be part of that. As a funder, if you were to approach me and to say, the whole cost of the whole thing is gonna cost $50,000. If you get five, I can get this person to get five. And this now I'm like, well, if Bernie's gonna get five, I'm gonna get five, you know? Or I've even said to Bernie, I'll give five if you get five. Um, and now we've got 10. Um, that abundance mentality and being bold about it from a nonprofit partner that says, look, our community deserves better. You know, our, the, you know, kids with developmental disabilities deserve better. And it's going to cost this to serve. And this nickel and dime kind of a little bit here, a little bit there and being overly grateful for that. That's super important, but we need to be bold and to say our community needs more and we need better and we deserve better. We need the resources for what we're doing. And we need to be compensated for, those, uh, for the work we're doing. And the last point that I wanna make about this is to be ready for something called snapback. So systems are designed, systems are designed to stand the test of time, to stand um, the, uh, to weather the storms that are there. Systems are designed in a way to be strong. So when you try to change systems, any system, so that we do things better or different, smarter, faster, we have to get ready for the system to pull itself back. It wants to self-correct. It feels like regression. It's called snapback. There's a whole theory around something called snapback, where the system pulls itself back. So you may feel like you're making progress, we're making change, we're finally getting people to buy into this and to be part of this, and the system feels like, uh, progress too fast, pull back. And that's just part of the work. So as we're working together better, smarter, faster, reducing silos and figuring out how to share resources together, especially in a time of COVID and a pandemic when we're in survival mode, remembering trust, how to do the right thing, not to be right, how to do with community, not for community, how to focus, keep the eye on the prize, to have an ab abundance mindset, to have a barn raising message, a compelling, we know the solutions, get behind us, we need resources to get this done and to be ready for regression as it occurs. Those are, those are, my, uh, that, those are my pearls of wisdom. I was asked to give a, a presentation about um, collaboration in times of change. 
So what I'd like to do for the last little bit of our time together is to think about, and this was really important as we had the um, conference last, uh, last May, this uh, 2019, um, is to think about sort of where are we now as a community? So considering COVID, how can the community best pull together, maximizing the strengths that have been listed in the session? So the things that we've already talked about with the teams that we have, but also the, the um, assets that we have here in Carbon County. What are the emerging issues that the community can coalesce around? And what are the next steps that are needed to do that? When you come back, I'd like you to briefly post your responses in the chat box. And then what I'd really like is for a person from each team for just less than one minute, share a reflection from your team on this piece. So you have 15 minutes. Sharon's going to move us into breakouts. And then when we come back, we'll have time for question and answer. And we'll get you done on time. Thanks, Sharon. Sharon? Yes, you did not very much. I, <laughs> I just wanted to let you know, I thought that we were done at two and I have a sick pup today. So I have to have her to the vet at 2.15. So I just told, well, Denise just popped back in. I told the folks who were in my room that I needed to just jump off because I wouldn't be able to be there to give the, uh, the update. So I apologize for that. And I'm so sorry I have to leave early, but thank you so much for everything. It's been great so far and I'll be yeah. on tomorrow. You guys then? Great. Thank you so much for joining. I hope your pup is better. Oh, me too. I'm sorry you heard. Did you guys hear her bark? No, that was Denise. She just went crazy while I was in the other room. Yeah. So. <laughs> my coworkers went crazy when they heard it. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's so, so I was like hitting the mute button real quick. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. All right. Thank you guys. Okay. So Denise, I'm going to try and pop you into another room. Okay. Doke. Good luck. <laughs> Okay. You're muted. Any feedback? Nothing yet. I think we um, lost a couple people. That breakout room is empty now. So, but I mean, that's okay. It's two o'clock. Some people probably have to leave early. When I got into the one breakout room, um, as soon as I started talking, somebody signed off. <laughs> <laughs> and then any feedback from you? So is this what you wanted? Yes, this is great. I think this is really good. This is a good way to kick it off. Um, and I think, you know, um, we had, uh, people could pick and choose which ones they wanted to go to. So I think, and, but I sent this to everybody. Um, so I think some people might listen in later because that was some of the feedback that I got was that, you know, they had, they would listen to the recording because they couldn't watch it now. But um, I want to do a survey after, too, after the, this week and just see what people thought and if this was helpful and if there's anything follow-up, maybe there are follow-up workshops and things like that that we can do. Great.
almost done. Huh?
How much longer do we have? Three minutes. <laughs> All right, we'll do a quick report out, any Q&A, and then we'll wrap up. She loves Zoom calls. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, welcome back. Um, I want to encourage you to share your team's responses in the chat box uh, to those questions. And I would like each group, I think there were five, Sharon? We started with five, but I think we lost a couple of people at two o'clock. So yeah. I think we had about four now. Okay. All right. This is the last part of our time together. So really quickly, we'll do a, a quick round robin of um, each group. So if you can share um, just a conversation or a theme that came up in your group. So group one. I believe that was our um, my group and something that we saw was that um, there are a lot of great things happening in the county, um, you know, different grants and resources and it would have been really helpful to kind of come together and to collaborate to put them maybe in, in one spot of um, this is a food grant that's open and this is the deadline and um, here's a basic need grant and a deadline so that we can all work together and make sure that maybe, um, you know, there weren't 10 things due in a two week span and that we could pool our resources and um, really maximize them. So that, that was an idea Alicia had and thought it was a great idea. Great, thank you. Group two. Or a second group. Yeah, I, I realize I don't remember what our group number is. So I'm just, okay. I'll just, uh, I'll just go. Um, oops. <laughs> Stop share. That's not what I meant to do. Overachieving group. They prepared a presentation. <laughs> yep, you know it. Um, sorry, I was trying to share the share the chat and talk at the same time. Yeah, basically, so uh, the members of our group shared um, really how important it was to network with like-minded organizations and share resources and share ideas and and share grant opportunities. You know, and whereas before. 
um, that might not have happened. It wasn't, it wasn't an intentional keeping from each other. It just wasn't, it wasn't as uh, straightforward of, of collaboration. So, you know, even things like how to how to figure out how to handle handle summer camps and split the work to figure it out. Um, and so, going forward, really helpful to understand what everybody's services are. Who can you call? How can you break down those walls? Um, and the group also pointed out that it's it's a really good opportunity to to try something different because if it fails, like everybody's trying something different. Um, and so we're, we're all in the same boat. Great. Group three. Is there someone from another group that would like to go? This is Mindy Graver. I'm not sure if I was group four or three, but uh, our group talked about how we were amazed with the natural leaders that stepped forward in the very beginning and for Carbon County, it happened to be the Chamber of Commerce that uh, again, each they took the lead and they ran with it. And it was amazing how they, they met weekly and they were so on top of things as to what is needed today. Um, the other thing we were talking about was how we were all forced to think outside of the box to get the same tasks done. But again, thinking outside of the box as compared to the way it always used to be. We were also amazed at how we worked so quickly together. Um, kudos to the United Way, their, your Facebook resource directory, uh, again, was uh, very instrumental in, in getting people to the right places and doing, again, where to go for the resources that were needed. Um, one of the things looking forward, we're hoping that, again, it allowed us to work and, and create new partnerships and I think it was great saying, we're hoping not to go back down the rabbit hole and continue those um, partnerships and, and breaking down the silos and still, even after COVID is passed, that we still work together. Great, great comments. Thank you, Mindy. Sure. Oh, was there one more group? Yes. Great. And I don't remember our group number either. Um, I think the emerging issue is um, everybody struggling financially, whether it's the individual. Um, we had people in our group that worked at the credit union and the issue there with people not being able to pay their bills, but also too, as an agency, um, the increase in the price of things and the, the cost of supplying PPE um that's and it's creating more of becoming overwhelming for everybody whether an individual at work or at home um personally so yeah great comment thank you for acknowledging that yep uh was there any other group i think we just was there just four Yeah, that was everybody. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for taking the time to uh, have those conversations with your colleagues and partners. When I think about what you came for um, an hour and 20 minutes ago, um, I hope that, uh, that, that uh, some of those needs have started to be met. I know that we have several sessions uh, yet this week. I really wanna commend the chamber and my uh, team members from United Way for trying to figure out an in innovative way for us to continue to find each other um, and I just want to to say again and underscore, um, take care of yourself. Uh, you are on the front lines, caring for our community in um, the toughest time in our lifetimes. And, um, you know, finding new sources of energy for yourself so that you can care for others is really, really critical. So, um, so at this time, I'm going to uh, open it up for any questions or answers. Uh, or answers that you have. <laughs> Maybe you have the answers, that'd be great. Uh, but any questions that you might have and, um, and then I'll turn it back over to our team. Or comments. I love the breakout sessions. I didn't know we could do that on Zoom. So that's something I learned today. Just good. For them. Thank you for having this. Good, good. Any other 
Uh, any questions or comments? I would agree. Yeah, the chamber. Go chamber. You've done some great work. And our friends at the foundation, community foundation, been great, great partners. Again, 10 years ago, I don't think we would have been there, but we are now. Well, if you have any further questions for me of any kind, or if I can ever be helpful to you, please let me know. We are pleased that we have a staff up here in Carbon County now and are working very closely with our other colleagues. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to serve you today and to serve our community together and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Back to you, Sharon. Yeah, thank you, Marcy. This was a wonderful uh, presentation and a great way to kick off the nonprofit forum. Um, just a reminder, we have three more days of programs. So if you're interested in joining any of those, um, just let me know if you're not already registered. Um, and sometime early next week, I'll be sending out a link to the recordings for all of the sessions so that you'll be able to listen on your own and share with colleagues and things like that. Um, if you have questions, as Marcy said, please feel free to reach out to the Community Foundation or to United Way. I know we're all just willing to help and um, do whatever we can uh, during this time and in the future when things are a little bit back to normal. So um, enjoy the rest of your day and and I will see some of you tomorrow. Aaron, Sharon, and Gina, you want to stay for a minute?